Hey, welcome to Birdie Fever. Today, I'm very, very excited to share a video with you about how I went from a 25 handicap to a four in two years time. I believe in an approach to practicing on course shots rather than spending a ton of time at the range with perfect lies and no consequence. In fact, I don't even believe in hitting more than 25 balls before I play the most crucial tournaments. Instead, I strongly recommend getting a course pass, a discount card, or becoming a member at your local course. This way, you can play as much as you need to to get better. I do think that lessons from a pro are still the best way to figure out all the quirks in your swing and get you swinging like the pros. With that said, I've learned everything I know about golf from YouTube without lessons. In the future, we're gonna be making a video about all the top YouTube coaches that made a difference in my game. But for now, I'd like to give credit to Mr. Danny Maud, who has what I think is the best YouTube golf channel for instruction. I've been watching the Danny Maud channel nearly this entire time that I've been playing and trying to go low. Every Saturday, he makes a video that is something or other good for my game. <laughs> Sometimes I'm laying in bed because of the time difference with Danny's channel. I always have a new video on my phone when I wake up on Saturday morning. I mull over whether or not I'm gonna open the video because I have to play that day and I don't wanna be messing with my swing on the course. So it is tempting because you know it's gonna be good information for your game, but you don't necessarily wanna be using it on the course when you're playing that day. I'll be tagging Danny's channel in the description just in case you haven't seen him. He has like a billion subscribers, so I don't know how you haven't if you're watching this. Well, let's get into it. Chipping and putting are the keys to unlocking lower scores. And so because of that, time and effort need to be devoted to doing those things. Here's a couple of things that I learned on my journey. Practicing chipping and putting, like with the three ball drill that I liked so much that we made a video about before, is one of the best things that I can do to make my chipping and putting be perfect to the way that I want it to be before I go out and play. We can never be perfect, but this is what gives me the confidence to go out and shoot those lower scores when I'm playing even somewhere unfamiliar. So let's start with the setup of chipping. I am in no way a PGA coach. I'm in no way a coach of any kind. This is just what I've picked up from videos from YouTube that made me a four handicap. First thing I do is I go through my routine, which we'll be going over a little bit later in this video. We're here off the green and I'm going to be chipping to a hole that is probably about 25 to 30 feet away. My first step is literally a step. Uh, so. I like to get behind the ball. Um, I like to aim my foot at the target, which I, again, I'll be going over a little bit more in our setup uh, routine video, okay? But we're gonna come here and then I like to make my tee, which I will explain later. And um, so then I, I like to set the club in the ground just to feel hardness, softness in the ground, okay? And then I kind of leave it there with uh, the face uh, square and I build in my shaft lean which is just here on my leg 
And then I like to grip the club uh, with my other hand. So uh, when you're chipping, it's probably best to have a neutral grip, but I kind of still have a strong grip. Um, just, I'm just super strong always, but this is as neutral as I get. <laughs> so uh, there's that. So I got my shaft lean. Now I'm gonna get my weight forward. Okay, this is made a slight bit easier by being on like a, uh, like a little tiny hill here. Um, and now I'm just gonna kind of get my feet together, get closer to the ball, and because this one's sitting down a little bit, I'm actually going to like lift the handle slightly more than I would normally. So normally I'd be down here, but right now I'm gonna do this because this ball is down a little bit. All right, so let's see how it comes out. That one's pretty good. Let's try another. This one's got in here good, so let's try this one. That one's pretty good, let's try another one. All right, so that gives us basically three balls that we've tried to hit to the hole, try to hit it in the hole. Uh, we were unsuccessful in doing that. And so now the next step is to go and take your putter and try to hit all three of those balls in on the first putt. All right, so I'm gonna use my marker just as I would on the course. So that I can line these putts up. Putting must be taken super seriously if you're gonna to try to get better. So first thing that I like to do, and I'm guilty of this even myself sometimes, is I don't walk the other side of the putt. Walking the other side of the putt is probably the best thing that you can do to make sure that you're reading this putt exactly how it needs to be read. So I'm gonna read it from this side first uh, from the backside. Uh, and sometimes I don't read the, 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 the backside of the putt or the, or the, the, the putt side of the putt. I don't read at first because sometimes you're, you're walking up to the green. And so I like to be prepared and for pace of play reasons, I'll, uh, like, so say, you know, we were coming over here and, uh, we got out of our cart and, you know, we're coming onto the green and my ball's on that side of the pin. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna read this side of it first. Okay, and I got it going this way just a bit. Um, and so I'm like, okay. And then I'm gonna come back over here and I'm gonna read it again. And sometimes it's actually easier to pull the flag uh, when you're looking at your mark because sometimes that uh, that flag could be leaning from the wind or um, it could be leaning just because and then you can't see what you're trying to do so I'm gonna read it here and I'm getting pretty much the same reading uh, this putt particularly because the Sun's over there we have uh, really good access to the way that this putt reads and so I'm not having any like problems reading it from a point of like I have conflicting sides but sometimes you actually have conflicting looks so one side will look like it goes one way and another side goes another way and that can be when you have a green that's actually completely tilted but the the undulations make it seem or appear that it's going the other way and that's when you really got to take a step back and you really got to come back here and look at the whole green to see what way that's sloping. So you want to try to get the overall picture of the green uh, while you're doing that. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to make this one.
All right, so we get set, get our feet in there the way we like it, and now I'm gonna go ahead and put it. So there's one. Now I have to go and make the other two balls in one so that this is a complete round before I go out and play on the course. If I don't make it, I reset and do it all over again. So we'll take our mark, we'll reset it here. And now because we've taken a putt, we know more or less uh, which way this should break. So, all right, here's putt number two. Awesome. <laughs> and then putt number three. Now these, I actually, once I get into this distance, I don't line them up anymore. So I use the line normally uh, to get my line of where I'm trying to go. But on these guys, I actually do quite the opposite. I'll take the ball and put it on a place where I cannot see any lines uh, so that it doesn't trip me out in my mind when I'm putting. These guys, you want to just take all of your animal instincts to make this putt in. You still want to be on a line and you still want to have the line that you're going on, but you just don't want to line it up to confuse yourself. It's really not that difficult. This guy just needs a simple boom. But obviously we skipped over a ball. So let that be a lesson to you to never keep a ball in the hole when you putt. I think it's actually a rule against that or something. So now that we've showed you the three ball drill, we're gonna go ahead and do some more chipping. I'm gonna get a little bit more in depth with the chipping that I do. So for small chips or chips that are on steep hills, I like to use a technique that I learned as a drill actually from uh, many of the YouTube coaches. Uh, so they, so what they do is they tell you to like drop your foot back. So they tell you to drop this foot back, but keep them close together just like you would if you were going to uh, make a normal chip. But you drop it back to about where your back foot is in line with the back of your front foot, okay? And what that does, or what it does for me at least, is it kind of gets you onto your front half. Um, so that way you're, you're doing, it's kind of promoting doing the right things, which is getting your weight forward, uh, getting your shaft leaned. So for me, it actually takes away power off of my chip, which sometimes is really good. Uh, so when I'm doing really small chips, something that I have to have really, really precise touch on, I like doing this versus the other route uh, where it's like a longer chip. So I'm gonna, gonna go ahead and demonstrate this for you and we're gonna make a chip. And that's pretty good folks. So after that chip, it actually brings me to another one of my putting tips which is to never take gimmies. Taking gimmies is a disservice to your game and yourself. When you take gimmies, it basically just avoids all of that short putting that you need when you're playing competitively in tournaments. So if you're thinking about getting down to a single digit handicap and you're taking gimmies all the time, I would say, think again and ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> the first tournament I ever played, I probably missed about five or six putts inside of like three feet. And it was because I just simply was not in practice of taking those putts. Again, what I like to do is if it's this close, I'm going to probably finish it off. So I'm going to come over here. I'm still going to get set and, um, and I'm just going to give it a nice stroke and put it in. There was a video that we made a couple of months ago, um, somewhere in the catalog, just a, a few videos down from here, that where I had, I was playing, we were playing in a scramble and I, I was playing with, uh, with chopsticks and I went to go make a tiny putt like that. And I literally kind of just like, I kind of just came over here and I wasn't paying attention, I was talking 
and I actually caught an edge on my putter and hit the ball like that. And it was hilarious and chopsticks had to make the putt because we were playing a scramble and we had to make it um, and I missed it. So it's still just a good idea, even if it is this close, just to kind of get in there, get set and give her a taparoo, right? All right, so now we're talking about putts like this. I see guys taking gimmies with putts like this all the time, okay? And this is about, let's see, probably one, two, I would say maybe a few inches past three feet. So this putt is in no way a gimme. <laughs> First of all, a putt this magnitude, I'm still going to read. And I'm gonna make a decision of whether or not to, to actually uh, mark and, and line it up. So on this one, let's say we're gonna line this one up. Sometimes I don't line them up. If they're any closer than this, I, like I said before, I don't like to line them up. I like to uh, just kind of use animal feel. But there you have it. You do not wanna take those putts as gimmies. And if you do, you're just going to ruin yourself. We here at Birdie Fever recommend lab putters. And lab is actually an acronym for lie angle balance. What that means is, is that when the putter swings backwards, it's balanced in a way where it doesn't allow you to open the face. So you can still kind of swing it offline, sort of, but it's still really good with that but it doesn't open or close the face as it swings. So what that does in turn is allows you to only focus on hitting the ball to the hole and not having to worry about, is this club gonna open or close? So it gives you a lot more confidence in putting and it's changed my game tremendously. I'm not gonna line this ball up or anything I'm just going to use my animal instincts and the lab putter to lag this ball really close to the hole. And so even though I didn't make the putt, I've gotten in that window where we are good to go. It's not a gimme and we don't like gimmies, but those are straight little tiny putts. And so that wasn't my best, but it's taking away the three putts. That's the big deal. You need to eliminate those if you wanna go low. I think this season I have the best chance to get to scratch because of this putter and its technology. There's more than just the lie angle balance. So while that is the big attraction, they also use what's called a press grip. And so this press grip, uh, mine is called the press grip number two, three degrees. And so what that means is that it's three degrees pressing my shaft of my putter uh, backward or pressing the grip forward, however you wanna look at that. Um, so what's happening here is, is that when my putter's flat on the ground, my shaft is actually going up through the grip diagonally. And so what that achieves is that when you hit the ball, you have a press in your grip so the ball stays online and rolling rather than hopping. So if you're putting like this and you're putting upward and you have a straight up and down putter, that ball is gonna jump uh, right there. So if you had a camera and you put it right on the ground and you slow mode it, you're going to see that ball jump and hop across the green and possibly get kicked offline. This is another secret to this putter is the press grip keeps the ball rolling on the ground and keeps it online. And I think that that has great importance. I'm admittedly not the best sand player in the world, as you've probably seen in our previous videos, if you've made it this far. However, 
I do know what to do. I just don't somehow execute it every time. So uh, basically I'm gonna walk you through how to do this, but if I don't do it very well and you don't trust me, which again, I don't think you should at this point, I implore you to go and check out Danny Maud's videos on sand traps or Alex Elliott's videos on sand traps. Those are the two guys uh, that have helped me. Like I said, I just got execution problems. So we are going to, uh, I'm gonna drop this ball right here in the sand, okay? And we are gonna be shooting over to a hole that is very close to here, okay? So this is gonna be like a short bunker shot, not really a long bunker shot, okay? So I'm gonna use my 58 degree wedge and I'm gonna, first thing I'm gonna do once I realize I'm in the sand is I'm going to try to figure out what kind of sand I'm dealing with. So there are different types of sand. There's fluffy sand, there's, um, there, there's wet sand, there's mud, there's, um, there's beach sand, there's white sand, there's black sand, there's so many different types of sand, right? But you gotta find out what type, what type of sand you're dealing with. So the best way to do that, uh, because you cannot ground your club, so I cannot touch this club to the ground before I swing. So I can't dig in there to see how much sand is under there, I cannot do that, but what I can do is I can dig as much as I'd like with my feet. So the first thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna line this up uh, similar to how you would line up a driver, um, somewhere on the inside of your heel here, um, at least somewhere to the front of your stance. Uh, we're gonna start to try to dig and kind of feel that sand. And so if you look under me, there's actually a little bit of wetness here, uh, still in this bunker because we had precipitation recently. And so this is not I, what I would consider light and fluffy sand. This is still heavy, uh, heavier sand. So I'm going to, so, so that's, so when you have heavier sand, when you have light fluffy sand, you want to open up the face um, probably nearly as much as possible and then try to take a stroke that just kind of cuts the uh the top layer off of that sand but when your sand is more wet or heavy you actually want to turn in the face slightly so you basically just want to have a normal face um and then you're going to try to kind of chunk this thing so we're going to give it a run i'm going to walk you through it here so we dug in right put our weight forward okay we need our little bit of shaft lean okay we also need to make sure that we keep that weight forward through the shot and we wanna to try to keep these legs as quiet as possible during this shot, okay? We wanna just use these big muscles and then we're gonna have the face right about closed, uh, just, just normal, okay? And I'm gonna to try, to, try to envision the right amount of, of juice here and one way that I do that is I imagine like how much juice would it take if I threw this ball like this, okay? But then I gotta think about the sand too. So then I gotta add a little extra for that. But this is a good measure to take when you're trying to figure out how much juice you should give a chip anytime, but definitely in the sand, okay? Then the last part of it is what I'm gonna execute for you or hope to right now, is that I'm going, to take an abbreviated backswing. So abbreviated backswing, I do not want to be up here, okay? I wanna take an abbreviated backswing and make sure that I accelerate through the shot. That is the most important part of this whole thing. Accelerate through the shot. If you don't accelerate, this is where people have the biggest problem, even yours truly. So here we go, we're gonna go for it. I didn't fuck it up. The first thing that I learned that changed my game for the better 
was the relationship between the two swings. And there are more than two swings in my opinion, but the two swings mean the iron swing and the driver swing. So I'm gonna demonstrate both of those for you right now uh, using both of the clubs. And um, then I'm gonna actually play this hole. Again, I am not a PGA coaching professional and I am not a coach of any kind, but these are just my experiences that I'm sharing with the rest of everyone. I'll leave you to check out videos from Danny Maud yeah, how to add and speed. Alex Elliott. So the about big the thing that people are really, uh, really, really conscious of is the control of this trail the side in your golf, golf swing. Okay? Now, there is I too many golfers during the take where we're just going to impact. I'm basically it, losing it, control. Trail elbow is popping out. All right, so now we're here at the tee box and I'm going to show you what the difference between the two swings is. So I have an iron in my hand. This is a seven iron. Basically, I want you to pretend that this is a wall that goes right here on the outside of my lead foot and goes up through here. On an iron, I want to get a feel of, of going, going to the top, hinging, and when I come back down, I want to feel this and I want to feel this shoulder breaking through that imaginary wall, okay? So I'll run it for you one time full speed. Okay? So, and then we'll do it slow-mo without technology, just slow-mo. Okay, so this here is at impact is actually through my foot, okay? That's the important thing. Now I'm gonna show you the driver swing. So on driver, we want to use all the same weight shifting and all that, and, and the guys, Danny Maud and Alex Elliott will explain this way better than me, but I'm going to just show you what I learned that got me to play better and got me from a 25 down to a four. So basically, I wanna still pretend that that wall is there. And in my setup, I'm gonna be putting the ball, uh, I'll use the ball for, for this one. <laughs> We're not teed up as high as we'd like. Okay, so I'm gonna put that ball right here, draw a line right here to the inside of my lead foot. I'm gonna have this uh, foot flared out and then I'm going to pretend that this wall is here okay and once that wall is there I do not want to break the wall with the driver so the difference in the swing is going to look something like this okay now we're going to do that one more time in slow-mo without technology Okay, now do you see the difference here? This shoulder should be going up and almost back. So you want some side bend here. You want your hip, hips out here, side bend here, okay? And you want to be, again, not breaking that wall down with this left shoulder you want it to be going up and back, and that will give you the best trajectory on your ball flight for a driver. One thing that made a dramatic difference in my game was when I learned that I should use an abbreviated backswing. We don't want to go full backswing. So the abbreviated backswing while using irons is amazing. While using driver, not so much amazing, but it does help you get better dispersion. When I first started, I used to swing at 110% fast back and fast forward as hard as I could. And it was the most inconsistent thing on the planet. Golf is a game of sustainability and repeatability. 
And because you need to be able to repeat shots over and over in order to go low, you don't wanna use 100% backswing. 80% is that number that you should dial into your head to try to feel when you're swinging the club. Some reasons why you wouldn't wanna swing 110% all the time are a couple of these. Say that you're playing a three-day tournament and on the first day you shoot a 68 and you're leading the tournament and everything's going great. The next day you come in for round two and you notice that when you get out onto the range that you're a little stiff and you kind of, uh, all right. And you start to hit balls and you notice that you're just not having the consistency that you normally would. Well, the reason for that is because your muscles are not always the same all the time. And so sometimes we have stiffer muscles and sometimes we have looser muscles. On those days that we're loose, we're probably gonna play really, really well. So there's all types of things that you want for sustainability and repeatability, like exercising to keep you maintaining those muscles as much as possible. However, if you get to the course and you gotta play in a tournament round and you're leading the tournament, what are you gonna do to make sure that you can play at your best? Well, I'm gonna tell you, it's 80% swings because you don't, if you don't need 100% or 110% on every swing, then that means that it's gonna be more repeatable for you to have 80% swings where you don't have to turn as hard or you don't have to you know, swing as fast or as jerky and it will be more repeatable and more sustainable for your game. Another instance is something that's happened to me as well, where I played in a wet weather tournament where it was raining and sleeting and I did not have the right equipment, so I thought. But it really wasn't about the equipment so much as it was about my swing. I was using 110% backswing, 110% downswing. So the grip became very, very slippery because I was gripping it so hard and so tightly and I needed to swing so fast and whip it back so fast. With an 80% swing, you can leave your grip lighter and that brings me to another point. When you swing the golf club, you should be with a five out of 10 grip. So I saw a cool exercise and I can't remember who this was. It might've been Alex Elliott, uh, but here's how it works. So when you have your club up like this, your grip is very, very light because all of the weight of the club is above you and in one line. When you bring the club to here, out in front of you, you have all of the weight of the club out here and so your grip gets tighter naturally. So what we want to see everyone do is basically do about halfway between those two. And that's the grip feel that you should have when you swing the club always. Instead of being real tight here or really, really loose here, it should be about right there. And so that's what you wanna feel when you come down here and that is the correct grip. All right, I saved the best for last, the routine. Your routine, no matter what you do, should be the same always and never deviate from it once you make it your routine. You can change your routine from time to time, but you have to have a committed routine before you go in to a league night or a tournament. It's important that you're able to do your routine whether you're playing a fast paced round or a slow paced round. Before I show you what my routine is, I'd like to tell you about pace of play. You don't wanna be a slow golfer, but then you also don't wanna be overly quick. The pace that you play at depends on how fast you can make calculations. If you're a quick calculator, then you should be able to play faster. If you're a slower calculator, then you wanna be playing at a pace that allows you to be able to make the calculations necessary. These calculations include wind, they include aiming, they include reading greens, whether you're chipping or you're on the green. You need to be able to walk both sides of putts. 
Uh, you need to be able to understand the firmness of a green or the softness of a green. There are so many calculations out there. Another thing with pace of play is that you need to be used to playing at all paces. The reason for this is because when I first started, I loved to play fast and I seemed to play fast really well. So I had a great pace, I'd have a great score. But then I would come across rounds where I'd play like six hours in a tournament round. And there was just no end seemingly to this round. And towards the end of the round, I would lose focus, I would get mad, I would have meltdowns, I'd have blow up holes. So get used to playing at all paces so that you will never have one of those rounds. It's also important to put out of your mind anything that's happening behind you. Don't look behind you, look forward, look at the shot, look at the calculation. Don't worry about anything that's happening behind you unless you hear four. The main point is to just do your thing and that way you'll be in your game, in the moment, and you'll score better. So now I'm gonna show you what my routine looks like pre-driver or pre-tee shot. So the first thing I'm gonna do when I get out of a cart is I'm going to obviously grab the club I need. Uh, and this is gonna be dependent upon whether I know the course or I don't know the course. So usually I will have some knowledge even if I've never played the course before because I use uh, one of the apps, which we will uh, have in this video as well. Um, I do that before tournaments to just kind of check out what's going on before I get to a course if it's a tournament. Um, if, I, if it's somewhere I've never played and I'm playing a practice round or a round for fun or it's one of those bucket list rounds, I'll kind of just go out there blind because I enjoy that. So the first thing I do when I get out of the cart and, and after I've grabbed my club is I'm going to look down range, look down the fairway, and or if it's a par three, I'm gonna you know look at the green, the terrain, everything in between and kind of just start to visualize my shot, okay? This is very, very important because most people don't do this. They just kind of get up, they look somewhere short-sighted and then they go up and swing. Uh, this is not good uh, for anyone's golf game. You need to envision the trouble uh, there's so many other calculations that you want to make before you hit the ball, but the first thing is definitely visualization. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look for my trouble. Okay, so now that I've kind of visualized my shot, I want to take note of what trouble could be ahead and maybe I want to change what I'm doing with my shot. So I'm still envisioning it going over the fairway, going into the fairway, and on this particular hole, playing a cut. However, that might not happen. And if it doesn't, I need to know what I'm dealing with as far as the trouble of the hole. On this particular hole, there is some trouble out here to the left and to the right, but for the most part, it's pretty open. We're just going to try to hit this baby cut right down the center. Once I visualize my shot, visualize my trouble, the next thing I want to do is check my wind. Okay, so ripping out a tiny bit of grass about this much, making sure the blades are free so that they're not clumped up and just kind of throwing them up as straight as you can will allow you to see what way the wind is blowing right now. We have a slight, probably three to four miles an hour width. Okay, that means the wind is coming from my back and going towards my target. So this is only good. <laughs> Not always the case. Next, I'm gonna grab my tee. And in this specific instance, because I'm showing you what my setup's like, I wanna show you that I use a tee system. This tee system is from Martini Tee. You can find them at martinigolftees.com, which is printed on every tee. 
I'm hoping to get a sponsorship by these guys um, or at least be able to become an affiliate or ambassador for them. I use nothing but these now because they're perfect. <laughs> so um, the reason why this is called a T-System is because this particular model of a Martini T is called the Step Up model. These come in various sizes and what they do is they have a little step here that hits the ground when you've put it all the way in. So then you have a perfect T height every single time. And that's what I needed because T height definitely matters when you're playing golf. Um, people that go down, I, see, I watch them, they do like these very impromptu movements. I just kind of shake my head and go like, I don't know how you do that because it's so minute of a difference can make such a big difference out on the course, uh, especially when you're aiming and things like that. Guess what? The next topic is aiming. So we are going to, uh, we're going to set our tee, okay? And this is after I've already envisioned the shot, you know, visualize everything I'm going to do. And we are going to like set our tee here. So I'm going to set my tee perfect every time. I'm going to check it. It's perfect every time. Just above the, the driver is where I like it. Most people recommend that you go halfway above the driver head with the ball. I just go just a bit above. So that's just my preference. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of stand back, look at my shot one more time, envision what I want to do. And then I'm going to step about three feet or so, maybe three to four feet behind and get my line with my foot. This is very unique. I've never seen anybody else do this other than me. Um, but it's something that I just kind of developed on my own. So the reason why I do this is because I get a nice pointed line with my toe and I envision it to my shot. Then I plant on this foot and I twist it to make a T. That way I slide back or step back and I know I'm on line. Then I only have to shimmy backwards, but I no longer have to worry about me being offline from where I need to swing. So then I just need to kind of step back in order to get my bearings of where I need to, uh, to get this ball in my stance. Okay. So now I have the ball on the inside heel, right? So you have your imaginary line that comes right here to your inside heel. I already have my T height perfect. Now I'm going to set my grip, okay? First one is I have a strong grip, so I'm gonna set it like this. Many coaches tell you, you wanna be able to see two and a half knuckles when you look down at your, uh, your lead hand. So one, two, and a little bit of this one. The next is I'm gonna set my arm. This is what I call give blood. So I'm gonna give the blood and then I'm gonna put my hand on the club without moving my arm back. That's very important. I have a very weird uh, grip with my trail hand that I'm not gonna show you because it's not good. So <laughs> the next one here is we're gonna hit this ball. And we went right down Broadway with the baby cut that we envisioned and we will see you at the approach shot. Hey, so here we are at our tee shot and we're here right in the center of the fairway after hitting a baby cut just like I told you I wanted to. So that was awesome that it only took one take to do that. I thought I was gonna screw that one up for sure, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, I do have my handy dandy range finder here and I'm going to come here, uh, you know, because we're working on routine right now, I'm going to come here, stand behind the ball away from my ball, just so you don't kick it or anything like that. A couple feet away. And I'm going to use the range finder, shoot it at the flag. 
Okay, I got my lock on distance with my Blue Tees rangefinder. It says 119. So I have 119, 119 yards to the flag. Uh, so again, I'm going to begin to visualize my shot kind of all in one swoop, check my wind. I got virtually almost no wind right now, which is great. Um, and I'm gonna start to assess my trouble. Like, so again, um, anything short is not really gonna be something I'm anticipating, but if there were like a lake or something in between here, you know, you don't obviously wanna think about that exactly when you're taking your shot, but you do, I mean, you, you do need it to make your decision on what club you wanna take. So in this case, the course management would say you want to kind of like roll or skip this guy because you have a back flag. You have some trouble to the left, but if you make a nice straighter shot, you shouldn't have that affect you. And it's almost not worth it uh, to try to, to try to fly it up in the air and kind of either come under it or, you know, get on top of it and have, front or back distance issues. Um, another thing that is course management related that I wanted to tell you guys is that when you are trying to hit a green, go for the center. This pin happens to be in the center and then back, but going for the center of the green is the best course management thing that you can do because if you miss a little bit to the side that the pin's on, then you are closer to the pin than you would have been. If you hit the center where you're trying to aim, you're not too far from the pin no matter what. And then that way, if you miss to the other side, you still have green to work with. So I feel that that's the best approach is just going center green at everything. And there's sometimes the hero comes out of me and I wanna take a shot that is a hero shot and it nearly almost bites me in the ass. So taking advice from me, from someone who knows, center of the green is your friend. All right. I'm gonna hit this 119. I'm actually electing to use my pitching wedge this time. So this club is about, uh, with a regular full swing, is going to be probably about a 145 club. So 140 to 145. Um, that's what I'm coming in these days in the cold. So we got 119 and I'm gonna be hitting this club uh, low. So I'm gonna be kind of just, kind of like a low flighted, uh, shot here because I can and I just want to roll it up there and I don't want to Try to fly it just there. I have like two or three other clubs I could use for a for a like a full shot and I just don't want to hit that shot from here And so I'm gonna use this this P wedge So again, I'm gonna get behind the ball a couple of feet I'm going to paint my line with my toe and then I'm gonna make my T, get into my stance, make my grip with my lead hand, make my grip with my trail hand, take a practice swing, envision what I'm trying to do, step to the ball and do it. All right, and there we go. All right, so I've grabbed my, uh, my 58 degree and my uh, putter. We're here at the approach shot. Uh, that was pretty terrible approach shot for me. I was trying to do something, didn't actually execute it, but I wanted to show you uh, the real deal scenario. So uh, basically, I'm up here on this hill. This green slopes tremendously down to the hole and it's going to be nearly impossible to stop so i'm going to have to chip this like almost laterally and get it to fall down to the hole so i cannot go at this hole if i go at this hole it's going to run so far beyond the hole we're going to try to get our t-bar here and i'm going to like i said when i'm on a hill like I showed you on chipping, when I'm on a hill, I like to go behind uh, with my foot to get my balance and keep my weight forward because 
that's what you need to do when you chip. So, and I want to make a little tiny chip here. I'm trying to read this green and I want to go right over there just to the top. All right, ready? Here we go. All right, that didn't get as deep as I wanted it to, but it is down there. We got ourselves a, about a six and a half footer. So now we have ourselves a little roller. This green is a bit tore up and is definitely gonna be bumpy. So we're gonna need to hit this firm with absolute confidence. So I'm gonna read my one side. I'm gonna pull the pin actually and walk to the other side because it's a little easier. Ooh. This is gonna be a tough par save with these bumps. So, in any case, we haven't had a perfect toll. We have a par save attempt here, and if we don't hit it, it's not the end of the world. We just wanna make sure that we you know, get out of here with a bogey and not a double. So when you make bad shots, everything is about being contained. I like to come off the ball and look at my line to make sure that it's where I want it to go. And it is, and we're just gonna have to pray that we get the right bumps here. So, pulling our mark away, get our feet set. Our line's set, here we go. And just like that, We've made a par from two bad shots. So golf is again, a game of repeatability and a very, very difficult game. Sometimes you're not gonna play as well as you'd like. Right now, because I'm out here filming and I have really not been playing golf, it's really, really not easy to come out here and just take swings. So. This is why you need to have your practice in. You need to do all these different things. But when things don't go your way, like they didn't go my way, I was able to still contain it and keep it down to a par when things got ugly. So that's the moral of the story. You want to make sure that when possible, contain the damage. Course management is a very big part of the game and you need to take it into consideration strongly with every round. So this brings me to a really important topic, and that's getting your distances to the pin. When you're playing a course, you don't just want to wing it. You can either be that guy wandering around looking for sprinkler heads, or you can get yourself a good rangefinder, just like I have here with my Blue Tees Series 3 Max. I've been using this for about two years. Finding a rangefinder with a magnet is very important because a lot of people seem to lose this device. I've seen so many people, friends and people that I've played with alike that have always left their rangefinder somewhere and they always tell you about it when they're on the course. So getting one with a really strong magnet so that it magnets right to the cart is a very smart play. And the Series 3 Max from Blue Tees does that. The Series 3 Max also has the slope function. Now I don't use this function quite often, but it is a great training tool to help you spot when elevations change and you get different distances based on those elevations. So like for instance, you have a 130 yard shot, but then you're also going down 80 feet or so, it's going to equal, you know, probably 10 to 15 more yards closer than it actually seems or is showing on a rangefinder. So enabling the slope function actually gives you the reading exactly what it is. Now, this function is illegal in USGA play 
and also professional play. So you wanna make sure that you have it turned off and it's done by a click of the switch right here on the side. Alternatively to a rangefinder, you can use a myriad of GPS apps. I like to use an app when I first started because I didn't have any other method of getting distances. I didn't even know what a rangefinder was until about two years ago. And when I first started and I was using those apps, I would always find myself going long over the green or short, way too short and getting into trouble. And that led me to be super puzzled about how I could hit a shot 170 yards with a pitching wedge. But the reality of it is I wasn't hitting 170 yards with a pitching wedge. It was just that the GPS apps were a little bit inaccurate. The GPS apps have improved over time and they're pretty accurate if you're on a budget. However, you can pick up one of these Blue Tees range finders for $1.99 or less. And you can do this by going to birdiefever.com and clicking on the range finder link at the top of our page that takes you to the Blue Tees website with a special discount. The three apps that I used when I first started were 18 birdies, Swing U, and the last one was called the Grint. Uh, the Grint I believe is the superior app with all of those apps. It has just about everything you could want and even more as far as like green mapping and all kinds of different features with the pro version. And I really recommend having that app. It's really awesome for scoring, keeping your stats and staying on top of your handicap. They've recently partnered with the USGA as of last year and they're really making strides in the GPS app space. I still use the apps the night before a big tournament so that I can look at aerial views of the holes and kind of plan my attack and kind of learn where the trouble spots are before I play. You can also shoot hazards on the course with a rangefinder by just pointing and shooting at them. You can shoot at sand traps, water. You can try to find land above the water or behind it so that you know how far you need to go to avoid a hazard. Whichever you choose, a rangefinder or a GPS app is one of the most crucial tools that you can use to lower your handicap. So you found yourself in the trees, which is often a common place that golfers above a 10 handicap find themselves. So today I've simulated being in the trees and having a shot that looks like it has a fun nice little opening here for you but it might not be the greatest opening i don't know about you but i'm one person who's found that lowest tree limb about ten thousand times in my short three-year golf career i have learned from the best course management people and scratch golfers who will always tell you do not take the hero shot. It's very rare that someone would say, yeah, let's go forward when they're faced with a bunch of trees in front of them. This one is actually not the craziest gap that you would not chase, I guess. Like this is not the craziest gap. So I actually would probably chase this one. <laughs> But for the video and for the betterment of your golf game and mine, I'm going to show you what you should do instead. So I have the trees and I could make it through. Sure. I could even go that way. Sure. But I'm going to turn and get this ball into the fairway so that I have the best chance of making a stellar next shot, okay? So I'm not looking for a shot that is going to be a shot that I need to make a second hero shot to get back into a par or get into a birdie or get into even a bogey at sometimes. I'm looking to be able to make one layup shot and then be able to make a decent shot to get really close to the pin. So we're gonna simulate that today. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna grab one of my uh, 
my low edges. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take my 60 out here today. And I'm going to pitch this ball right out onto this fairway. Okay, perfect pitch out. Okay, now we are perfectly pitched right out onto the center of the fairway and we're gonna go take our measurements and let's try to get this one super close for you to show you how to do it. All right, so we're here at our shot and we're right here in the center of the fairway. All right, so we have ourselves 74 yards. I got my 56 in hand, I'm gonna set up and we have a green here that I do not want to fly all the way there, but if I do, it's a nice um, nice hill there that can bring me back if I go a little long. All right, so I want to make sure I get it there, but I don't want to go short or super long. <laughs> so here we go, 74. All right, we've caught the back of the hill, just like I was saying, if I did go long, it would uh, come back for us, and so that's awesome. All right, so we're here at our ball, and we've gotten within about, I would say, 15 to 18 feet. Uh, so our very, very first shot was in the trees, simulated. We punched it out to the fairway, we put it to here in three, and now we have a par putt. However, this green that I'm using right now is very, very bumpy and has some, uh, some growth issues. So we are going to putt this, but it's okay. If we miss it, we just want to get it close. Um, we want to try to make it, but if we don't make it, we want to just be within a tap-in bogey, and that keeps you in a tournament or a league match. Okay, so there we go. We didn't make it, but we're right here and we have a nice easy tap in for bogey. And that is what you wanna to do to be able to save yourself in these situations. The first game I started to play was a game where I only hit irons. So this way I would get to clubs that I never got to normally because I would only go driver, wedge, putty. Driver, wedge, putt. Driver, wedge, putt. And so you don't get to hit your five iron a lot. And then, like I said earlier in the video, I don't like to repetitively practice one club consistently for a long time because it actually isn't really good for your game. So the best thing to do is always to get out to the course and play course-like conditions. So you don't wanna be hitting off of mats all the time, just like you don't wanna be hitting the same three or four clubs all the time. So to get yourself to be able to hit other clubs, this is a fun way to challenge yourself. The second game that really helped me get to a lower handicap was playing from shorter tees at first. This will help your confidence and it will make you not trip out when you get to lower scores. So for instance, if you're getting around par or even below par, it's not such a big deal to you later on when you're playing from longer tees. This was really, really difficult when I first got to my first round close to par, I started getting really, really nervous. So this is a fun way to let you get down low and make it not be such a big deal later. The third game that I used to help me get down to a lower handicap is my favorite. And it's called the worst ball game. So what you do is you hit two balls from every shot and you play the worst one. Pretty simple and straightforward and it really energizes your game and makes you get into a shot and make a shot. So you can't just go lollygag, 
you know, oh, ho-hum, you know, and play the hole. You must play the worst ball every time, which helps you focus and play from worse shots that make you better. All right, so we're here at the Birdie Fever Studios and now we're gonna go over our equipment section of this video. I recommend getting a simulator system at home if you have the space and the money. If you have the money but not the space, consider still purchasing a launch monitor for the driving range. If you don't have the space or the money, consider renting time at a simulator at your local facility or your local superstore. Just about all areas these days have a mom and pop simulator business or they have a Golf Galaxy, a Y World of Golf, Dick Sporting Goods, Shields, PGA Superstore. But there are also larger places like X Golf as well as some others. Now I'm gonna show you what the numbers mean and how incredibly useful they are to understanding and improving your game. Practicing on the sim, whether at a range, home, or a simulator, to get accurate stock yardages of your clubs is absolutely key. Then from there, figuring out what yardages your clubs can hit while performing at one quarter, half, three quarter, and full swings is extremely helpful as well. Once you know your distances, it's important to translate these onto the course. One way to do this is to bring your simulator to a range to sync the real distances that you're hitting. Most range balls will provide a pretty close distances with wedges and irons to dial them in. Another way is to use a range finder to shoot a flag on the driving range and see how the distances you're hitting stack up to the simulator distances that you recorded prior. All right, so let's get into what the numbers mean. I have my trusty pitching wedge here and we are going to use the SkyTrack system here today for you. So we're gonna set a ball down and I have uh, all my uh, metrics here that we're going to be using and I'm going to kind of show you and go over what those metrics mean uh, and do. All right, so we're going to hit a shot for you. Here we go. Okay. All right, so there's a little shot there, just barely made it onto the green but we're gonna show you what these numbers mean. So basically over here, it shows me what my carry was, okay? And I have not warmed up at all. So that's why you're gonna get 127 out of my pitching wedge. So it tells me the carry and the total distance. So what we're concerned with mostly is carry. And the reason why is because the total distance depends on conditions. So it depends on if it's dry, if it's, you know, dry and firm or if it's wet and soft or, you know, there's so many different variables that you can have. You can have uphill and downhill and wind in your face and all that other stuff. So it's just important to figure out what the carry it, uh, averages are of your club. I recommend hitting like five to 10 shots per club and then trying to do an average of those shots. Um, it will also average this out for you and when you select your club, it will track all of those shots and average it out for you. So right now my average is total is 129, but I would average out the carry. So I would write them down, average them out manually. That'd be a little bit better um, recommendation for you. So um, it, it shows you uh, your accuracy, how many times you've hit the green that you selected. We have a green set at 150 because that's usually right around where this goes, about 145 for me. Um, and so then we have like our advanced uh, kind of like numbers here. This is gonna show you the optimal launch angle. So there's a range between 22 and 26 that they're saying is good for a pitching wedge. So mine's 27, I hit wedges and irons 
extremely high and higher than most people. Uh, it'll tell you your optimal spin range, which is 7,800 to 8,600. Um, so my spin is gonna be low because I use low spin shafts on purpose because I usually have high spin. So that's actually not normal for me. Descent angle shows you your optimal range. So your descent, um, mine's 51, it's coming in a little too steep, a little too hot. And then you have your max height, your smash factor. It also has some measurements like ball speed, club speed, side angle, spin axis, club path, face to path, face to target, and a shot score. I like to look at these. It shows you how far off line you are from the line, as well as your face to target and your club path. Face to target is going to be closed. So I'm closed there, 2.1 degrees. And my club path is inside 4.9 degrees, which is not bad. All right, so I've plunked a couple out there onto the green and the results are coming in a little bit low of normally where I would be. However, it is a little bit cold in here tonight and so it might not be performing quite as well as normal. But in any case, it just gives you an idea of like all the data that you can see about your shots as well as like, you know, where your heat map is and some other uh, really, really good data, especially your averages of where your clubs are going. So this software allows you to dial in uh, temperatures, wind, conditions, all of that stuff. You can simulate all of it. You can put things at firm or put things at soft or put things um, you know, crazy, uh, humidity up or down, uh, you know, so if you're going somewhere, you can kind of check out like the humidity that they have there, the elevation they have there, the temperatures that are going to be there. You can punch all those in and dial it up on this range and see what your shots are going to be like in that altitude, wind, barometric pressure, all that stuff. Okay. Having a simulator is very, very important. But like I said, if you can't have one at home or you can't buy one to take to the range, definitely go and rent some space at one of the facilities in order to get those stock distances. And you want to do that probably a couple of different times a year, but definitely once a year, just in case you've lost some muscle, lost some flexibility, lost something, um, or gained even, you know, maybe you gained some muscle or gained some flexibility. Maybe you headed to yoga classes, um, or you started doing CrossFit or something. I have no idea, but you definitely just want to check all that stuff so that you know, that you're not surprised when you get on the course that you're hitting a ball, you know, uh, 160 with your pitching wedge or you're hitting it 120 now when you used to hit it 140. And so you just need to be aware of what your distances are and that's gonna dramatically help your game. All right, so this brings me to swing aids and practice tools. So while simulators and putting greens and chipping greens are the best, there are a few tools that I used before I had access to these things. One was called the Perfect Practice Putting Mat. It's a putting mat that allows you to hit nine foot putts or 15 foot putts if you buy that model. If you have the room in your home um, or in, in your garage, you can use the Perfect Practice Putting Mat. And it's basically a putting mat that will get you to be able to repeat different putts from different distances and there's even a smaller hole that if you're feeling froggy and you think you can hit the center of that, of that smaller hole, you can use that to get uh, the cup to look even bigger. But one of my other favorite tools that blew my mind when I first got into these uh, practice tools was 
the pitch assist. This is a tool that basically lets you see what the angle of your face is and it's mind blowing for most people. So how it works is it works off of a magnet and you pop this right onto the center of your club face. Most of us at the non-scratch level don't really even know where the center of the club face is. But um, what I would say is like right above your first groove is where you want to start it. Um, and then you got right there, maybe somewhere near the second groove. That That is uh, usually the center of the club face there. You could put this on the center of the club face and then you can twist it uh, so that you know what straight is. And so this tool helps you understand that when you open your face, your launch angle will go up and the ball will go to the right. And when you close the face, your ball will go lower as well as left. So keeping the club face in an actual straight position is very vital for you to hit straight flighted shots. This was a very inexpensive tool that allowed me to understand what a straight club face is. We have a link in our description to get yourself one of these and they are very inexpensive. One really important thing is to make sure that you have a good T system. Now this could be something that you're doing on your own or it can be all within a product. Mine is within a product called the Martini Step Up T. They are three and a quarter inch tees that ensure the same consistent height every time and I love them. So basically what it is, is it's a T that has a little notch and that little notch hits the ground and goes in a perfect position every time. And I love these. These are also linked in our description of all of our videos. So another major milestone jump down in my handicap was when I had my first club fitting. So I went into a club champion and got fitted for some clubs and shafts and everything else. I was able to take my current club set because it was brand new. So we used those heads, but I switched some shafts that are lower spin and were better for my game. Yours may require something different, but getting fitted is the most important part. Get out and have a fitting to see some sim data and try some club configurations and see what works best for you. Now, if you played hockey, tennis, baseball, softball, or all of the above, you may wanna consider using a larger than normal grip on your club. For people that have done that, I recommend the Jumbo Max Ultralights or any of the Jumbo Max grips because they're just larger in size you should be able to have a five out of 10 grip when gripping the club. And in order to do that, sometimes people that play other sports feel that they need to grip golf clubs very, very hard. And that is not the case. It needs to be a five out of 10 grip when you're swinging a golf club. The reason why it should be a five out of 10 is because that ensures the most repeatable swing, strike, and ball flight. And that's just really hard for me to do with factory grips. I'm gonna throw in some extra tidbits to let you know how to have the best round. And it's sometimes things that people don't think about. The first thing is using the restroom before you start your round. It actually seems like it's silly to think about that, but it actually is really good to make sure that you are not anxious on the course at any time. At the beginning of your round, using the restroom can really help you not be anxious for that reason at least. Another good tidbit is to make sure that you're hydrated. Now this can mean different things to different people. For me, it means having a bottle of water. For others, it means 
they might need to get a little tuned up with that swing lube, if you know what I mean. One extra tidbit is to have a snack waiting for you after hole 12. This can be something as simple as like trail mix, granola bar, protein bar, or I've even seen people use peanut butter and jelly out of their bag. It's really good to get your sugar up and keep your focus late in the round. This can be a mistake if you start to run out of sugar and you lose focus and you start to become anxious or hangry. If you do that, you're gonna make bad decisions on the course and basically ruin your round with a blow up hole. And nobody wants that. So bring a snack with you, extra little tidbit. Well, that concludes our video. This is everything that I could think of that helped me go from a 25 to a four handicap in two years. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope that you picked up something that's gonna help your game go low. If you liked the video, please subscribe as it's the best way to help our channel grow and be able to make videos like this or even better ones in the future. Thank you for watching and we'll see you on the next one.